Throughout my childhood and my chess career in general, I've admired different chess players. In today's video, I'm going to show you the 10 players that have influenced my chess to the better the most. Before we start, I just want to emphasize that this is the top 10 best chess players according to my own experience. These players have shaped my chess specifically in the way it is today. They gave my chess personality. It's very likely you will disagree with the players in this list, and actually that's fine, that's the whole point of the video for me to show you why these guys are my favorite chess players. Maybe introduce you to a new person. Let me know what your chess, your favorite chess players are in the comments, and I think that's it. Let's, let's get going. In the number 10 spot we have the 28-year-old Russian Grandmaster with a current feeder rating of 2701 and a peak rating of 2720, Daniel Dubov. The reason why he's in this list, I don't know what it is actually, I don't know if it's his crazy opening preparation or his crazy tactics, but either way it's crazy and it's entertaining. I seem to always leave uh, with a smile on my face when, when I see his games. Very exciting chess, very creative, and that's kind of a common factor within the players in this list. One of his greatest achievements is to win the 2018 World Rapid Chess Championship held in St. Petersburg. What I'm going to do in this list is I'm going to talk about each player and I'm going to show one of his best games, or her games, we're, we're going to see. In this position, with the white pieces, we have Daniel Dubov, and with the black pieces, we have Sergei Karyaki. Now, Dubov just took on d6, attacking the queen, and also threatening to take on g6, because this pawn is pinned. Bishop e6 was played, stopping both of those threats, and now, well, stopping both of those threats, and now, Dubov calculated and played the brilliant queen takes g6. David, why is this brilliant? This is giving up a queen for two minor pieces. Well, this is something I like emphasizing over and over. The most important thing in chess is not material. The most important thing in chess is ultimately checkmating your opponent. And one way we do that is by activating our pieces. So activity is a high priority in this position. Why? Well, okay, this king is pretty unsafe. King safety is another big reason. And there's so many pieces that could potentially create threats. So in this position, black could uh, play queen f7. Queen c6 may have been a little bit of better of a practical try. Queen f7 was played. And once again, if you have a materialistic mindset, you would say, oh, David, look, rook e4. We pin the queen to the king. We're going to get our queen back. But that's a bad move. After g takes f6, bishop, bishop takes f7, rook takes f7, your attack has diluted to nothing. And yeah, you, you're actually down a pawn in this position. So this would be a very bad move. Dubov understood and, 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 and just comprehended that this position, you have to play with compensation. We have to play with activity. Bishop takes e3 was played. And if we take a look at this position, these two bishops are extremely strong. This rook is, I mean, going to potentially be in the seventh rank. Knight e5 is always in the air, so you have to watch out as black. And actually, black play king h8, very logical move. Rook e4 now works because there's nothing to take on f6. Uh, queen f5 was played. Rook e7. As I said, the rook is in 7th rank, and in this position, black had to find the miraculous bishop takes f2, but played rook g8, which unfortunately doesn't work. Bishop takes g8, rook takes g8, d takes c7, and now this pawn is going to be a pain. This rook is in the 7th rank, this bishop is also a pain. But once this knight gets in, into a better position, or this rook, it's going to be pretty much game over. After a couple more moves, we're not going to analyze in depth, because we would be here for the whole day. Rook takes g7 happened, you can't take c8, queen is a is happening and after king takes f5 rook takes g8 black had to give it even more material and once again if we look at the beginning of the game white gave up material and gained activity in exchange in this case black gives up material and doesn't get anything in exchange so of course after a couple more moves black resigned daniel dubov number 10 very creative player in the number nine we have 20 year old indian grandmaster with a current feeder rating of 2778 and the peak rating of 2778, meaning that this person is currently in his prime, Arjun Erigaisi. The reason why he's in my list, or in this list, is that he's so composed, he's controlled. For someone who, of his age, um, well, I mean, I'm also his age, I'm, I'm pretty impatient, he, he seems to make it look easy to manage your emotions, and yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the players that I think is also a little bit undervalued. He's not as invited to closed tournaments as the other uh, as, as the other players and if you don't understand that let me explain that quickly close tournaments are people that are in the same kind of rating range as you and he's playing open tournaments which means that he's he may be able he, he might play against the 2500 and if he draws against the 2500 because his rating is so high he's gonna go 
nowhere. So he runs a very big risk by playing these open tournaments. And that's something that the top elite players like him usually don't do. Let's take a look. Oh, yeah, sorry. One of his greatest achievements is to, well, recently overtook, uh, Vichy, overtaken Vichy Allant in the ratings list, making him the number one Indian player, the ranked number one, which is extremely difficult. You have no idea how difficult that is. Let's take a look at one of his games. With the white pieces, we have Arjun Erigaisi, and with the black pieces, we have Radoslav Vojtzek. Let me know in the comments if I pronounced that right. I'm quite sure I messed it up somewhere. Please let me know. After e7, white is threatening to both promote with d or with the e pawn. But black plays bishop c7. Another very important lesson. In this position, many of you would think, well, okay, this guy didn't notice that I'm promoting. Look, I'm just promoting. I'm winning. Let me let me get the win quickly. Let's, let's get out of here. But this is not what chess players, strong players do. What strong players do is, what, my, what does my opponent want to do? And the answer to that question is, rook takes g3 is in the air. So if you were to promote either way, you're going to lose immediately. You're going to be met with a cold shower. And, well, okay, of, of course Arjun didn't do that. Arjun found the winning e8 equals knight. Under promotion to a knight. Now rook takes g3 is not possible, of course, because this is check. King f7 was played. And after knight takes e7, now you're going to promote the other one. If black plays rook takes e2, of course, you just promote and you're winning. Black play rook d2. And once again, Arjun could have played rook takes d2 and gone into this craziness where you give checks and maybe you win, maybe you don't. But Arjun, very composed, just says, okay, that, that's a little bit unclear. I'm going to go for something that is 100% winning. Knight b5. Rook takes e7, knight takes e3. We get to this endgame where these two minor pieces and the pawn for the rook is more than enough to win and this is objectively winning a couple more moves. Once the knight and the bishop coordinate together like this, it's game over. Black tried a very creative trick, actually, rook g4. If takes g4, sacrificing two rooks to try to get stalemate. If you were to take this, this would be a very big mistake. There's nothing black can do, so this would be stalemate, a draw. And black was losing, so black would be pretty happy. Why wouldn't be? So, uh, king f3, what Arjun does is he calculated everything, king e4, gets to this d5 square, and if black keeps sacrificing the rook, you're just not going to be stalemated anymore. The bishop now no longer exists, so g7 is available. And black tried one last trick, rook d2, but bishop d4 once again. You can't sacrifice, king g7 is available now. And if you don't do anything forcing like a check, rook h8 is going to be mate. Arjun, as you guys see, very strong player, composed and well prepared, deserves to play in close tournaments. In the number 8 spot, we have the 28-year-old Hungarian Grandmaster with a current fear rating of 27.15 and a peak rating of 27.76, Richard Rapport. The reason why he's in my list is because he's also very creative, but in my opinion, out of all the elite players, he's the most unpredictable. Now, I, I, I'm predictable in a good way. I could be unpredictable and play 1h4, g4 and lose in 3 moves, but uh, he's, he's unpredictable in a, in a good way. He, one of his greatest achievements is to have earned his Grandmaster title at the age of 13 years, 11 months, and 6 days. I really like how he's encouraged the chess world to maybe not study the main lines. You can get away with playing some weird stuff and, and make it creative, craft it at home, accurately execute it over the board. This is, this is something I like about Richard, that's why he's in the number 8 spot. Let's take a look at one of his games. With the white pieces, we have Richard Rapport, and with the black pieces, we have P Peter Svidler. Uh, Richard just played rook f4, attacking the queen, and what you're going to notice about this position is that black is very passive, and even has to go even more passive. Your queen is attacked, if you move it to somewhere like e5, then you're just going to lose this, queen g5 is the same thing, so you have to move the queen somewhere where it defends the rook. Uh, queen d8 was played by B Peter Svidler, and once again, all black's pieces are pretty passive. In this position, white says well there's some, there must be something in the air this king is very unsafe and you're saying this pawn before we go into the, the move that richard played this pawn you're gonna say david that pawn is worth one point i disagree respectfully disagree with that statement this pawn on h6 is not one point that pawn that pawn is doing some so many things blocking this pawn make sure that this bishop doesn't get to g7 make sure that this king doesn't get to g7 that pawn is more than one point so such a strong pawn this pawn is one point but one point i i agree in this position, Richard played bishop takes d7. Why? Well, okay, Richard wants to give a check to this king, and there's nothing you can do as black. If you try rook takes f4, bishop takes e6, rook f7, queen takes d8 is mate. If you try knight takes d7, queen takes e6, rook f7, queen takes f7 is mate. And if you try queen takes d7, queen takes f8 is mate. 
But there's nothing nothing you can do after bishop takes e7, black resigned. Peter Zwiller is known to be very respectful. And yeah, uh, Richard Rapport, one of the most unpredictable players, if not the most unpredictable player um, in chess, in a good way. So this and that. I probably don't have invested in anything. The number seven spot, we have the American genius, the person that left a legacy in chess, and yeah, with an estimated rating of 2,409. Paul Morphy. Now you're gonna say, David, what what is a what is a person in black and white image doing here? What, what is a person that was alive 200 years, almost 200 years ago, in this list? What what is that? And why does it say non applic not applicable in this? Well, all of those answers is that well, he was a player of the past. He's no longer alive. That's why it says not not applicable. And the reason why he's in the list is that he revolutionized the way people look at material and activity. I like emphasizing this over and over until you start sacrificing pieces and checkmating your opponent because you're prioritizing activity over material and which is what some Paul Morphy taught the whole world and also it's such a tragic yet epic story that Paul Morphy had he was such a good player that no one was around to give him a good fight and eventually gave it up there was not enough money for chess back in the day gave it up tried to become a lawyer didn't succeed had a little bit of a bad ending but let's let's focus on the games of course one of his greatest achievements is that in the 1850s Morphy was acknowledged as the world's greatest chess player. Let's take a look at one of his games. With the white pieces we have Paul Morphy, and with the black pieces we have the Duke Kara. In this position, bishop g5 was just played by Paul Morphy, pinning the knight, and black played b5. Now, in this position you may think, okay, the bishop is attacked by a pawn, we're not going to take because a bishop is 3 points, a pawn is 1 point, so let's play bishop d3 or bishop e2. Now, if you play that, then you give time to for black to, to get pieces out and get a game. In fact, already here, maybe knight c5 is a, is a little bit annoying. So what Paul Morphy does is he understands that activity is worth more than material and plays knight takes b5. David, that's giving up some material. You're losing one point. Well, yeah, you're right. Materially wise, you are losing. But over the board, because the king's safety is such a big factor in this position, who cares about material? Black's extra material is down in the corner doing nothing. In the meantime, white is getting all the pieces into the game. Rook d8. In this position, Black's, sorry, White's only piece, Paul Morphy's piece on h1 is not doing anything. And Paul Morphy said, not in my watch. Rook takes d7, Rook takes d7, Rook d1. Now every single piece is doing something. And that's one actually common thing in, in, in Paul Morphy's games. Once everyone is doing something and Black is doing nothing, I mean... This cannot move, it's not legal. This could move, that would be legal, you would lose your queen, good luck with that. This bishop cannot move, that would be, uh, th that's illegal. This rook could move, good luck with that as well. The only move that you can kind of play is queen e6. And after bishop takes e7, knight takes d7. The reason why this game is so famous is that queen b8, knight takes b8, rook d8 is a beautiful final checkmate. This bishop is defending the rook, this king cannot take the rook because it's checkmate. King e7 is also not possible. Paul Morphy revolutionize the way we look at material and activity. Let's do this and this. In the number six spot, we have the 48-year-old Hungarian Grandmaster with a feeder rating of 27, 2675, sorry, and the peak rating of 2735, Judith Polgar. Now, we're getting into the big leagues. Judith has revolutionized female chess for forever and continues to do so. Um, what she did and her story is so fearless, so confident, she was playing chess in an environment that in in, in, a, in a time where the chess world wasn't giving precisely the, the the good opportunities to female chess players and she came demonstrated that that's not that's not true that female chess players can be as strong as male chess players beat everyone and yeah one of her greatest achievements is to be widely regarded as the strongest female chess player of all time her games are so complex and dynamic that it makes motivates me to play fearless chess myself Let's take a, take a look at one of her games. With the black pieces, we have Judith Polgar, and with the white pieces, we have Alexei Shidov. Now, knight f5 was just played by Judith, claiming that if you take bishop takes g2 is a problem. So, in this position, Shidov was, okay, bishop f2, I'm going to move my bishop away. Now, once again, if we look at white's pieces, they're kind of blocking the white king. So, in this position, after a little bit of calculation, Judith played queen takes g5. David, that's sacrificing the queen. Well, after this, you give a check, you take the queen, and this e4 pawn is falling. So you just you, you just won a pawn by taking on g5, remember? But if you if you go into this line, now you win a second pawn. 
you can't take bishop takes h1 is in the air so black would be winning what white's tried is not a five saying okay this bishop is creating trouble because once again this bishop is constantly taking stuff in the diagonal so not a five i'm gonna try to encourage that bishop to get away from from this area but now judith doesn't care about that 93 this is the crazy thing about games like with people like judith polgar they're so dynamic someone's attacking something the other person attacks something else 93 attacks the queen once again if you take this time you don't get material it's just checkmate right away this is a beautiful checkmate because all, all these pieces are on the way well these two pieces specifically you can't move the king this is checkmate so queen g3 was played if you take the knight this is not working either queen takes e 3 followed by knight f3 this is this game over let's say this this that would be mate and well okay you have an extra queen in this position so what um what alexei should have tried is queen g3 but after queen takes g3 and knight takes e2 check you got your exchange once black plays pretty accurate accurately and gets the the knight out this is a winning position and a couple more moves later judith polgar won judith polgar revolutionized female chess for forever and continues to do so in the fifth position we have vishwanathan anand also known as vishi anand with an age of 54 year old a 54 year old i should have said 54 year old indian grandmaster with a current figure rating of 2751 and a big rating of 2817 vishi anand but never mind let's forget about that um He's the great, he, he, well, one of his greatest achievements is to be a former five-time world champion and became the first Grandmaster from India in 1988, which is so difficult to believe, knowing that nowadays India has so many Grandmasters. He's, he's in this list and he's pretty high in the list because I, don't, I not only admire his strong play and accurate and good preparation with computers, but also that his, his psychological strength, you can't be, uh, uh, you, you can't be world champion, such a strong player, uh, a family member have good hygiene be respectful be humble have a good job how do you do that without being strong psychologically and that's something i truly admire about him but let's take a look at one of his games in this position with the white pieces we have vishy anand and with the black pieces we have joel lautier a very strong player and after h6 anand is undermining the structure you're gonna say david what does that mean every time i hear my coach saying undermining the structure i, I don't care about what what was why is that important? Well, undermining the structure is very concrete sometimes, but sometimes it's long term. In this case, it's pretty concrete. You will see. G takes h6. Black is saying, okay, that's a pawn. And well, the problem in this position for white is that you can't take because then you get to this position and yeah, you, you're, you're lacking material. And in this case, you don't have any attack. So white, instead of taking on g2, leaves that for later and goes for another motive. Attacks the king and attacks the queen at the same time with bishop g6. In this position, if you take the queen, this is going to be mate very soon. So black tries to defend in another way. Um, there's queen f6 as well, but this is also winning after bishop takes f7. And bishop a3, bishop takes e6. Eventually you're going to win, this is white. So black tried actually knight e7, if I'm not mistaken. Knight takes e3 also doesn't work to this. Sorry, to this first. Queen takes d4 and then bishop takes e3. Bishop takes e6 is pretty difficult to stop. Bish uh, the bishop is taking on d4. King takes g2 is a problem. Everything is a problem. So after bishop g6, 97 was tried. But queen takes d4, rook takes d4, and rook d3 is a very accurate way of playing this. Now you're attacking the rook. If you move it away, this is a problem. So black, by the way, black takes, bishop takes d3 happens either way. Something similar happened in the game. Rook takes d8, bishop d3 either way. You save your bishop and this bishop is pretty scared. That bishop is going to fall soon. You could save it with bishop h1, but good luck using that bishop in the future. It's in jail. And in the meantime, white is just taking everything. Bishop a3. The dark squares in general are pretty weak. Black eventually after this, um, after in, after bishop d3 resigned the game. There's not much to be done as black. Bishy Anand, psychologically very strong. Let's move to this. Surprised I haven't messed this up. In the fourth position, we have the 30. 31 year old Chinese grandmaster with a current feeder rating of 2745 and a peak rating of 2816, Ding Lijian. Ding has recently not been in his prime, definitely, and he had kind of a breakdown after becoming world champion, um, which I guess is a nice problem to have, but at the same time horrible because a great responsibility has great power. A great power has a great responsibility. I said it the other way around. I failed my Spider, Spider Man quote. Um, when you have a great uh, great power, you have great responsibility. And that's kind of the same thing to say high stakes is high intensity. He had a breakdown and I, I believe he's coming back. That's the reason why I put him in, I promote the idea of Ding Lijian. 
getting back to form. I think that people seem to forget how strong he was in 2017, 18, and 19. He was definitely up there. He was so difficult to beat, so accurate. And that's one of the things actually I put in, included in his greatest achievements. He, other than be, being world champion currently, he has an unbeaten streak of 100 games, which was the world record before a guy called Magnus Carlsen came around and overtook it. Let's take a look at one of his games. In this position, with the black pieces, we have Ding Lejeune, and with the white pieces, we have Magnus Carlsen himself. So bishop f4 was played by Ding, pinning the knight to the king, of course. Bishop c5 was played by Magnus, now threatening queen of 8 mate. And in this position, Ding already calculated this, and knew that there was a move that both defended the mate and attacked at the same time. And that move is 97. And that's extremely. That this is an extremely efficient type of move to do in chess. You're both defending and attacking at the same time, and after this, Magnus resigned, there's nothing to be done. If you take the knight, rook h1 is mate. You can't do anything. You can't take the knight because with the knight because the bishop is pinning the knight. You can't take the rook or play king g2 because of the bishop. If you take the bishop, of course, you take with the knight. And if you play f3, that's just procrastinating the problem. Bishop takes f3 is still going to be threatening rook h1. If you tr tr keep trying to defend it, I think the cleanest way to win this is something like knight f5. And you, you fork these two guys. So after that, after 97... Magnus resigned the game. Ding Liren, number four, very accurate. I think he's going to put a good fight to Gukesh. He's getting back to form. He's a very difficult player to beat, or he was in his prime at least. In position number three, we have the 33 year old Norwegian Grandmaster with a current feeder rating of 2832 and a peak rating of 2882. Magnus calls. And of course, I was going to include him somewhere in this list. Um, yeah, of course, I, I don't think the, the first word that comes to your mind when you look at Magnus is not respect. Um, but it's not disrespect specifically either. He's just a, the most complete player in the world. He's He knows how to convert winning positions, defend losing positions, maneuver in close positions, at, attack in crazy positions, uh, play in the opening middle game and the end game specifically, play psychologically, play fast when your opponent is running out of time. He seems to know everything. He, he exercises outside. He squeezes an advantage in drawing positions. He's so complete. And he's taught everyone that a drawing position doesn't mean you have a, draw, a drawn game. One of his greatest achievements is to have become the five, well, be a five-time world champion. And he has the, held the number one position since 2011, which is crazy to think. Let's take a look at one of his games. Um, oh, I already changed this. In this position, with the white pieces, we have Magnus, and with the black pieces, we have Sipke Ernst. Let me know if I pronounced that correctly, please. G to H takes G6, opening the H file was just played by Magnus. Knight G8, preventing Bishop takes H6, or at least that's what Black thought, because Bishop takes H6 happened either way. Opening the H file. Now, Black is in trouble. You can't... Yeah, it's it's difficult to, to play something here. Uh, you can try... Well... You can turn knight takes 6 but after this, queen takes e7, queen h7 is coming. There's nothing you can do to stop that in a, without giving a thousand pieces. You will eventually get checkmated there. So black tried g takes h6, but rook takes h6 comes either way. It's funny, it seems like black is defending what about uh, around what white wants to play, but not really. Knight takes h6, if you play king just g7, rook h7 is made. So knight takes h6, queen takes e7, knight f7 has to be played, good defense, but not enough unfortunately. King g7, and now... White cannot win only with a queen and a pawn. So rook d3 was played. Rook lift. Why this? Well, now... Well, okay. If you take this, you're going to get checked. Checked. Mate. So, black is kind of against the... Uh, struggling a little bit here. You're going to say, David, isn't this back rank? No, it's not. But black did try kind of a trick around that. Rook d6. If you take this rook, now queen e1 is definitely going to be played. But rook g3 was played by Magnus Force. Magnus is not going to fall for that. Queen e5, king takes f7, and queen f5. Now, king h7 doesn't work to queen h5. Rook h6, queen f5, king h8, queen e5, king h7, queen g7. So after that, queen, king takes f7, queen f5. The point is that you're going to start taking material with checks. So king e7, you give a check. And then it doesn't matter, king d8 or king d6, queen takes f8 is going to come with check. So rook f6 was played by, by, by Ernst. And in this position, the beautiful final position for white is queen d7 mate. Because of both, those, both of those two rooks, they're awkwardly placed. You can't do anything. White is winning. Magnus Carlsen, the most complete player, number three.
In this position, number two, we have the 32-year-old American Grandmaster with a current feeder rating of 27.93 and a peak rating of 28.44, Fabiano Caruana. Caruana is in the number two because he's so humble, he's respectful, he seems to be so down to the ground. And trust me, I've, I've said this before in this list, but when you're talking about top chess players, believe me when I tell you that it's difficult to find someone that is, has good hygiene, is respectful. I mean, look at me, I'm, look at my hair. Uh, I'm not even a grandmaster and my hair is kind of crazy. So when you look at someone pretty sensible and decent, and um, okay, sorry, maybe I'm insulting him a little bit. He's such a good person, Fabi. Um, then you're impressed, and that's what happens to me. Every time I look at his games, I seem to learn something. He plays chess in such a correct way. He's incredibly well prepared. He's such a machine in terms of calculating. And one of his greatest achievements, not only about Fabi, but in chess in general, which is absolutely crazy, is he recorded a 3098 performance rating in 2014. This is the highest in history. No one has ever achieved something like that. And it's it's crazy. It's I don't think anyone's going to get close to it anytime soon. He's such a machine. Let's take a look at one of his games. With the white pieces, we have Fabi. And with the black pieces, we have Ruslan Ponomaryov. And very strong player, by the way. And g takes f7 was just played. Now this bishop is attacked. Bishop takes f7 was played by Ruslan. And now white, Fabi had an idea. Had the idea of playing bishop a6. Threatening queen b7. But the problem is that after king takes a6, you have no good follow-up. Of course, queen a8, queen takes a8. You're just blundering the queen. So, because an idea doesn't work now, doesn't mean you have to eliminate it. So... Fabi said, okay, I have that idea in mind. How do I make it work? Oh, rook e7. Very good move. Now c7 is attacked. I mean, there's nothing you can do other than to take the rook. If you don't take the rook, then what are you going to do? King b8, bishop a6 happens either way. So, queen takes e7, and now bishop a6 works. There's not, there's not, there's no defense. You can sacrifice your pieces like that, but that's not going to make anything better. King takes a6 was played. Queen a8, mate. And this is actually a sign of respect. This happened over the board. When your opponent is letting you checkmate you over the board, that's a sign of respect. So, good stuff from both of these players. Fabiano Caruana, composed, respectful, so strong. I mean, his performance rating, 3,000. That's amazing. Okay. And the number one spot, everyone's, everyone's been waiting for this moment. Or maybe no one. We have the 55-year-old Ukrainian Grandmaster with a current feeder rating of 2648 and a peak rating of 2787, Vasil Ivanchuk. The reason why he's number one and my favorite chess player personally is that I think every single chess player should aspire to become like Ivanchuk. And I'm very serious about this. I think that with with chess gaining popularity and new new young players coming into the game, they may be discouraged or, or this... How do you say this? Uh, getting the wrong idea by looking at the famous media personalities. And... Um, Vasily Vanchuk is a, an incredible example of someone that cares about the game, doesn't care, doesn't outside Europe, doesn't make eye contact, doesn't doesn't talk during the game, doesn't try to move pieces around to to confuse you, doesn't get angry when he he, he loses. If anything, angry at himself. He analyzes the game regarding on his oh, who's who the opponent is, what the rating was regarding of he won or lost or drew. Vasily Vanchuk cares about what he reminds me of what truly chess is about, which is respecting the game respecting the, the player and finding ideas and enjoying the, the finding of those ideas. Vasily Vanchuk, one of his greatest achievements, or he's remarkable because he's been ranked world number two three different times in 1991, 1992 and 2007. Let's take a look at one of his games. With the white pieces we have Vasily Vanchuk and with the black pieces, funnily enough, we have Sergei Karyakin with which he was the, the, the victim in the first game and now he's closing being a victim in the last person we're going to talk about so in this position i have a funny story after 96 in early 2000s my my coach my the friend of my coach was looking at this position and they they, they created this idea they came up with a crazy move and uh, a grandmaster friend told another grandmaster friend and another grandmaster friend and eventually the word got to ivanchuk now i i remind you this idea was created by a friend of my coach so i have a connection with that in the early 2000s, 2003, 2004, and Ivanchuk was playing this game in 2008 and got to play the brilliant Queen takes E6, which is the idea that has had been looming around or 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 circulating for such a long time. This used to happen quite a lot back in the day. Um, after this, you're essentially giving up the Queen for two pawns. 
but the reality is that it's pretty complicated. Queen e5 was playing, we played queen e7, rook h1, and queen takes e6 is played nowadays. But queen e5, you can kind of can, can transpose into that. Um, but of course, this is a new idea. If you're in Sergei Skariakin's position, it's difficult to play. Knight takes g7 was played by Ivanchuk. We're not going to analyze this in depth. I'm just going to show you the game, what happened. <coughs> Sorry. Knight e6 check what ha was what happened. King f7, rook h1, queen takes e1, and a very important intermenso, knight takes c5 check. King g6, rook takes e1, king takes g5. After all of this liquidation, eventually we get a position like this, where Ivanchuk has is down in exchange, but in exchange has so many pawns. Black was playing uh, played a5, defending the pawns, but eventually you will get so many of these guys in this endgame, a couple of moves later. White actually get, got all the pawns possible, and in this position, Black resigned. Vasily Vanchuk, what everyone should aspire to be, or to become. Thank you very much for watching, those are my 10 favorite chess players. Let me know what your favorite chess players are, let me know if you disagree with me in a constructive way. And yeah, subscribe, give a like, I would really appreciate it. I've worked a lot for this video. And uh, let me know if you want longer videos, shorter videos. I really tried to make it tight. So that did com come to a cost of less analysis. But yeah, thank you very much. Hope you appreciated the video and have a nice day.